Welcome to Earth, a love story. I'm your host, Robin Lassiter. Guess who's back? John Hartigan from Samsara is for Lovers joins me again, this time to talk about so much. (laughs) We talk about so much. We get right into it in this episode with Pluto's return and what it means for the 2024 election, Gaza, substance use disorder, why fentanyl is being put in the drug supply, and much, much more. These are things that I've been wanting to talk about for a while, all of it. They're things that we're all exploring, all swimming in, maybe to varying degrees. But what they all have in common is suffering and what to do about it, how to think about it, how to engage with it. And even though punk rock is dead, says John, its spirit lives on. Together in this conversation, we find that revolutionary spirit as we explore a secret third option about how to engage with all of this. What is the best way to bust out of the empire? The best way to weaken the systems of oppression? Turns out, it's through connection to each other. It sounds simple, but tune in. It's powerful and experiential and relational and beyond all the conceptions and simulacrums of ideas that we're swimming in these days. And this all speaks to the orientation I'm feeling lately towards a collective of people who are not collapsing the narrative down into an easy us versus them answer, but who are holding paradox and space for something new to emerge. The feeling that the fringes of society, the edge dwellers, the weirdos, the mystics, the wonders and artists and experiencers, the people who aren't neatly situated inside of the consensus reality overculture, are the ones who are really needed in this time. I think it's the scrappy counterculture who will live new stories into being, stories that we need as we face the multitude of crises which are arising. And yes, I include myself in that counterculture, even though I live a docile life in the Shire in a little hobbit dome in the middle of nowhere. I am still punk rock, I whisper to myself into my chamomile tea at 8.30 p.m. on a Friday night. And also, don't get me wrong, even as I say fuck the empire, which I say and I mean, hard on the systems, never the people, and even as I call upon us to enter into a bloodless revolution through joy, more on that concept coming soon, I am also well aware that we are the empire. I am the empire. I am the overculture. It is in me, and I am it, even as I do the work to decondition and dissent. And in this episode, we get into all of that. And throughout the conversation, John delivers a Dharma talk that weaves in Tibetan Buddhist cosmology and practices, and also talks about harm reduction in a way I've never heard before. And it really changed me and enlivened me. Okay, almost ready to get into the episode, but a couple of fire tending items first. One, speaking of scrappy kids and the fringe, I don't know if you guys know this, but I am connected in with all of the big, wonderful muckety muck people in the ufology and paranormal worlds. And I love having big names on the podcast. Like I love having these people on the podcast and uh, hearing their wisdom and seeing what they're bringing to the world. And I have several of those well-known folks coming up soon. It's going to continue to be a part of the podcast. And also, I really love hearing from you, hearing your stories. And what I would like to do is to start sharing your stories on the podcast So if you have a wild experience, or if every time you listen, you feel like you have something to say or add, please reach out to me. Send me a voice note, and I'll play it on the show. I'll put a link in the show notes where you can send that no more than like five minutes or so, please. Or you can also reach out to me to be a guest on the show. Tell me about your story. Let's meet. Let's talk. Let's see if you'd be a a good fit for being on the show. Your shares and appearance can be anonymous or not. It's up to you. So reach out, engage with me. Who's going first? I'm thinking of someone, but I'm not going to call you out. Send me voice notes. Let's get to know each other and let's continue to build this community. And second, 
Speaking again of people holding paradox and seeding new stories, the Bridge Collective is open and accepting members. We have an incredible group of folks signed up, and I'm continuing to get downloads and information about exactly what this shared space will be. Reach out to me soon if you'd like to join. The sooner the better, actually. Registration officially closes July 1st. Okay, that's all. Please now enjoy this conversation with John Hartigan from Samsara is for Lovers. Yeah, I just wanted to really connect with you. I wanted to I wanted to communicate with you. I mean, it's been so it's been so wild. Um, current events have been like mm-hmm. so intense with everything from uh, COVID and the Donald Trump presidency into the you know genocide and Palestinian liberation movement and Mm -hmm. joe biden and this this new election that's coming up and there's just there's just no shortage of opportunities for people to find anger or like get attached to what we think we know about things and and divide ourselves and to have just ignorance as our authority and mm-hmm. like our higher power, so to speak. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to kind of, I wanted to connect with you because I know that you are connected with Dharma and that you're just on like your trip and you're exploring <laughs> all this stuff and connecting with people. And I just wanted to, I was, I was just kind of hoping that maybe we could just figure out ways that, uh, or just talk about ways that we're able to actually like show up for people and, mm. and, uh, maintain some sort of balance and serenity in what feels like you know the fall of america Mm -hmm. that's what it feels like to me anyway and i just you know there's a lot of people that feel it the division Mm -hmm. and the anger and the confusion and uh i was just wondering if we could talk about those things plus with the fentanyl and the xylazine that's in the drug supply and uh it's just a it's just a lot so my life is like basically the unhoused community with xylazine and fentanyl and crystal meth and alcoholism and mental health problems and then I, when I'm not with the unhoused community and I'm with the housed community, it's, it's all politics. Mm-hmm. It's just like talking about the election, talking about war, talking about imperialism, just, it's just like this. Um, that's the, that's the reality and that even exists in the unhoused community too. There's there's no shortage of radios and and gadgets and smartphones in and, and the unhoused communities. People, it's not like people are are in the dark when it comes to current events. And uh, it's also it's just really it's just a really intense time. And there's this spectacular, you know, Pluto's return coming for the united states there's different dates that different people say but if if we're going by the years and the sizes of the actual constellations we have this pluto's return coming at the 2024 elections which is like i think it's like 247 years after the declaration of independence would be signed and then we have uh all this evidence of empires falling during the Pluto's return. So we have like the French revolution happened during their Pluto's return. England was divided into England and Scotland during the Pluto's return. Rome fell apart multiple times during their Pluto's returns. Mm -hmm. Um, Egypt was divided into monotheistic and polytheistic clergy 
there's just no shortage of these empires dividing and crumbling and a lot of them rebuilt, but nobody like made it through a Pluto's return without falling apart. Mm. And it's just like, whether it happens or not, it's fascinating to look at the evidence for it by looking at the past, whether you believe in astrology or not. And I'm used to disappointments when it comes to apocalypse prophecies because I, I went through like Y2K in 2012 and all these things. And, you know, they were okay, but they weren't what it all cracked out to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because I, I mean, funny in like a, you know, terrifying kind of way, but I, you know, and I've had lifelong contact with other beings who starting at the age of like four would show me these, these visions of Armageddon and destruction and chaos and, and implant in me, like, you need to do something about this. It's really urgent. Do something about it. And I'm like, I'm four, you know, I don't know what to do about it. And I've had this urgency my whole <laughs> life. And then, yeah, watching Y2K come around and then 2012 and, and having these over and over again, especially in the early 2000s, just like date after date, event after event, where something was supposed to, to really shift. And it didn't in an overt, visible way. But like, I changed my life. I changed my life based on the prophecy of 2012. I gave away all my stuff and lived in a yurt for two years. And so it had an effect on me, even though the whole you know, the, the kind of cataclysm that we were expecting or something, whatever it was that we were expecting didn't happen. And so now, yeah, we're looking at these dates, 2024, 2027, Pluto's return, feeling it. Like I feel it. Everybody feels it, I think. And there's also a part of me that's like, what will, what will happen? It can feel sort of unbearable. One of the most helpful teachings for me has been in the past few years is to be able to sit in the unknown like sit in the liminal space, not lose my mind either way and not know what's coming, but trying to be present in the liminal space without collapsing into utter fear and without um, pushing it away, but just kind of sit with it and finding the most helpful path. Yeah. So anyway, everything that you're bringing up actually feels quite like quite a relief in my body to talk about it so openly and overtly because I talk about it. Yeah. Like relief in the body is always good. I talk about it. Um, you know, we talk in, in, uh, I'm part of several communities and it's definitely talked about, but it's not, but not so openly and overtly. Yeah. So it just feels really good to just like say it, <laughs> you know, yeah, just say yeah, the yeah. thing and be like, all right, this is what we're looking at. Yeah. What, what I heard you saying for me, like you're saying, like sitting in the open spaces. And I, I've been experiencing that more and more as just the grief mm. of it all. Yeah. And sometimes the grief of it all can be like terrifyingly overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And there's a desire to escape from it. And there's a desire to be distracted from it. And, but also it can be like a cause for great compassion to rise like altruistic compassion like yes there is this horrific grief the suffering of it all the inescapability of it all the fact that the ego can't become liberated and uh i can't get rid of my ego for long periods of time while maintaining a human form and functioning in a society that I actually do not want to be isolated from any longer. Mm -hmm. So my experience is, is like, if I can recognize the Buddha nature, right? If I can recognize the infinite consciousness within everything every finite cell housing this infinite conscious energy if i can recognize that in everything including the grief including my own ego including 
just all the neurosis that everybody's experiencing all of the time, plus all of the ways that love is manifesting all the time, and all of this fantastic wisdom and liberation that we're actually dancing around in all the time, but we just are too distracted by, I am too distracted by my own thoughts and emotional experience and my own identity to actually recognize that I'm just dancing in liberation all of the time. Um, the, the grief itself is actually like the very source material that mm -hmm. gives rise to compassion for all sentient beings. It can be just as desire can be the very source material in which we're able to be compassionate for everyone that has cravings or experiences attachment to whatever it is that they're attached to. And then just as any of the afflictive emotions or neurosis are actually the wisdoms and the heart practices themselves, maybe this grief is, is equal to that, that there's this great heart practice and there's this great wisdom that actually comes from this grief, this great grief, this total sense of like, we're all in for it and we're not getting out of it. There's no, there's no getting out of this. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Grief has been in the past few years, my absolute biggest alchemical journey. And it was surrendering to the fact that the thing about it <laughs> is that you can't negotiate with it. It's a no, you know, it's a, it's a no. And you have to sort of sit at the feet of that no and kind of surrender to it. And whether or not the body has capacity to hold the bigness of the grief depends on like how, how much I'm able to go into it or need to come out of it just for my own like safety and, and sanity but developing the capacity to hold more and more and more of that, of that grief, just that coming up against some kind of futility, not being able to can't talk my way out of it. Can't practice my way out of it. Can't like, can't buy my way out of it. You know, it doesn't like not, not possible. And so instead bearing it, like bearing that truth, that's why I like have joked, said, but I'm not joking that, you know, like the first noble truth that suffering exists. If I just like, that could be the practice for the rest of my life, just accepting that it exists and watching what unfolds from it, which as you said, is this um, flowering of, of compassion. It's just, it's a flowering of compassion for self and others. And for me, you know, I spent a lot of time bypassing doing spiritual bypassing and kind of not knowing anything about Buddhism, but getting little Buddhist sound bites from, you know, Facebook and whatever in the early two thousands. And so I spent a lot of time thinking, Oh, the, the goal here is just to jet, like, we're going to get out of here. We're going to ascend. There's going to be this, this ascension. I'm going to get out of here. I don't have to feel my feelings. I don't have to sit with the body. I'm, I'm going to get rid of, I was like really angry at the ego, really pissed off, wanted to squash it and get rid of it. And discovering that, it's actually like, this is where we are. This is, you know, the body is part of it. The emotions are part of it. And there's, it's actually the fertile ground. If we, if we already are, you know, the transcendent, the transcendent uh, integrity, transcendent compassion, if we already are this, you know, Buddha spark that, um, that we all are, we're, it's not going anywhere. And we're in human form for like, I think for a reason. And part of it is to feel what it feels like to be human and to go through the very human experience of like feeling our fucking feelings in the face yeah. of this horror of this horror. And it is truly yeah. horror, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm with, I'm with you. Totally. It's, there's this overwhelming it's just an, an overwhelming amount of I wish I was allowed to like 
compare it to things that are written about mm-hmm. in the tantras and the sutras because they they really I will I'll just do some Vajrasattva later but when we talk about like how, how anger is piled up to the clouds and and ignorance is a mountain you know that we can't even see the top of and desire is like an ocean that we're just like stuck in the middle without a boat and there's no land in sight right it's like that's really how it feels like so much of the time with the people that i'm connected to on a daily basis that we're that we are literally like most these most these people are never going to get sober right so they might not ever be able to live a day for the rest of their lives where they where they're not chasing cravings and they're not just completely obsessed with their attachment to substance and then all of the things that come from that attachment right they're never they're never going to experience liberation from that but even within that daily routine that cycle of getting well and then trying to function and whatever it is that their daily cycle is there's still liberation in that there's still all of the neurosis all of the heart practices all of the wisdom all of the bodhicitta is still accessible nobody's shut off from it like no matter where we're at and it's really really weird for me to try to recognize the buddha nature inside of the crystal meth and inside of the xylazine and the fentanyl and inside of the wounds and be able to actually see it that's the weird part is to actually be able to recognize it theoretically it's like yeah sure everything has the buddha nature it wouldn't exist it can't exist if it didn't everything has this these infinite consciousness energy everything is all is love right but how how is everything love when it's just like it's it's very easy to question it so it's it's actually like going into the grief and into the ignorance and into the things that we deny about ourselves the most and then that's where we need to do like that's where i need to do the most work because that's where i need to do it and it and it really like i love what you said about the first step because the first step and like and uh i said step but the first truth right is like it is acceptance right and and acceptance takes us all the way into the these depths of non-violence i mean there's I mean, if we practice acceptance and nonviolence enough, we're going to, we're going to end up just sitting in Zogchen, you know? And if we sit in Zogchen for long enough, we're, we're going to get, we're going to fall into the neurosis of blissful ignorance Mm -hmm. for me anyway. Right. So I have to like balance it out. I, uh, I don't, I don't want to get consumed by blissful ignorance. I don't want to, um, get out of samsara forever but i would like to be able to rest in zogchen and mahamudra and vipassana and shamatha and all these words right basically i just like to get out of myself for a while so that i can recharge so i can come back into myself and so i can actually like be of service and recognize the infinite and the divine in the in the places that are the hardest to recognize it and that's that's the grief that's the grief because it's just it's just a it's so heavy and undeniable and inescapable and i still have a hard time looking at it and there's still a lot of stuff that i deny about it and i'm really distracted by a lot of current events you know it's really easy for me to have opinions on them uh, it's really easy for me to uh, point fingers at people, countries, 
and it's really easy for me to have opinions about my own country. You know, I would like people to have a decent education and I would like there to be health care and I would like the quality of living to improve for citizens and non-citizens alike that are inside of this whole entire make-believe facade that we've created for ourselves. But if people want to come into that facade, if they want to live here and like, I just don't understand. I just, it's so easy for me to get, have opinions on things like how much money we spend on war while our kids can't even like have a freaking music program in public schools anymore, because unfortunately, you know, we, we have to, um, fund the slaughtering of children in record numbers that has never been seen any time and before, you know? So there's just, there's just so much of that. And then there's like these, you know, the leaders that were given options to, to vote for, we're allowed to vote for like, who's our favorite scumbag, you know, but I don't really want to vote for a scumbag. So why is voting for scumbags our freedom? Who's, whose idea of freedom is that? So there's all of this, there's just like this gigantic gift basket of delusion and ignorance that is presented to us on a daily basis on media and news and just the whole entire system that I like to call samsara right? But it really is just the entire system itself. And it thrives on dividing us and separating us and keeping us having these opinions, you know? So there's like, for me, there's like nothing to do except for sit with the grief and show up for people with a willingness. Even if I don't know how to be supportive for the people, I, I'm, I'm still going to show up with that willingness to be there for people because I don't think anything actually makes the system weaker than us actually connecting with each other mm -hmm. and moving beyond our opinions and our divisions. Right. When, when I talk, when we talk about the, the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. And when, when we talk about, I got sober in a 12 step program. So we talk about recovery, unity, and service a lot. Mm. And I may have talked about this with you before, but the definition of recovery is to return to our natural state, which is the Buddha. And then the, the Dharma is like what teaches us and gives us this experience in order to actually get out of ourself and recognize the interconnectedness of everything, the emptiness of everything, the unity of everything, right? So we have recovery and unity. And then Sangha, which is like everything, all beings are Sangha. And there's, there's really not much to do except for be of service. So when we say recovery, unity, and service, we're not talking about anything other than the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And it's on all of our little 24-hour coins, right? Recovery, unity, and service to thine own self be true. And where I'm actually like looking at is like, how do I apply this, this refuge to everything that I am experiencing on a daily basis from the housing epidemic to the political epidemic to the economic epidemic to just the to just the epidemic of samsara, right? And it actually works out pretty well as long as I can maintain recognition of the infinite in all beings without exception. And as long as I am freaking capable of showing up with the willingness to have an open mind and try to connect with people regardless of the prison that they've built for themselves, you know, just because they've built a prison different than mine, my opinions, everything I think I know is this fantastic bubble that I like to put myself in and limit myself by. And everybody does it. It's just part of the human experience. There's Buddha nature in there, right? It literally is. 
it's looking out the windows of our eyes all the time right and um yeah i'm just trying to connect with people regardless of their opinions and what they think they know i'm just trying to like really show up for people and and recognize that the you spot it you got it aspect of of life the mere like wisdom isn't just negativity you know, when I, when I see things in people that inspire me and I find to be beautiful and attractive, it's not, it's not because there were no longer mirrors of each other. So I'm just trying to like maintain like this recognition and in a time that is just so foggy and cloudy that it's sometimes it feels difficult to, to, to see through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you so very much. I have developed, I have done a lot of work to develop capacity for the, for grief, for suffering, um, just that acceptance that this is what's happening and not try to get away from it, but just bearing the reality of it. And now what is emerging, which is, which is as hard, if not harder than doing that is one thing that you talked about right at the end, which is that uh, joy also exists. You know, this, this, like you say, the mirror doesn't stop working when something good arrives. It's not just the difficulties, not just their neurosis. It's not just that it's also this like miracle bliss connection, like seeing, you know, when, when the Buddha nature arrives and it's not behind veils and veils and veils, and it's easier for us to see for whatever reason, those moments feel incredibly powerful. And like you were saying the most kind of, you didn't say it exactly this way, but my language around it is like the most radical act that you can do is to connect with someone, like having conversations with people that will never be on social media, that no one will ever hear other than the people in the conversation. But that act of of deep connection, deep presence with each other is a radical act that does affect the world. And it's just hard to remember that and believe that when we see, you know, everything that's going on and everything that's so heavy. So it's actually, it's been really challenging and I'm, I'm like leaning into it, but it's been challenging to be like, Oh, actually allowing myself to feel great joy in present moments in the midst of, you know, samsara in the midst of the horrors feels helpful. And it's very difficult to come to that conclusion. It's like, no, I I need to be in the suffering with everyone. And the way that I've come to make sense of it is as the suffering is not going anywhere and I'm not trying to get away from it, but there's a both and, and something else, you know, when that other mirror aspect arises, that is, you know, beauty, joy, love, uh, connection, like the miracle of another human being doing something nice for, you know, for someone. And that arises in front of me and I see it, like, it's okay to expand into the feeling of the joy, the bliss, the, the goodness of that. Um, and it doesn't mean I'm negate, like pretending suffering doesn't exist, but it seems to be as important as building the capacity for grief. And so that's what I'm seeing right now, it seems. And what I'm seeing is it's like two halves of a whole. Like the evolution through suffering actually does work. If things get uncomfortable enough, you will, you know, we do change. Like if we're lucky enough to have that opportunity, if it gets bad enough, we might make a change and then we can evolve through that process of suffering. But there's also a way that I think, you know, Tantra speaks to, which is evolution through joy that is also there. And so I'm leaning into not excluding one or the other, but but having a both and with them. So I don't know if that's resonant for you or makes any damn sense, yeah. but <laughs> I think so. I think it definitely makes sense. I, it, it's hard for me not to refer to Buddhist practices yeah, because, because um, it's just, this is difficult not to, because it's such a huge part of my life, but um, weaving together the opposites of, you know, grief joy recognizing i'm going to tie that back in with that inside that grief there's there's got to be this spectacular heart opening that there and this like spectacular wisdom that exists i don't understand why grief would be exempt 
from that since since every other aspect to experience and existence seems to have these things evident within it. Everything has a neurosis. Everything has this heart practice. Everything has this wisdom. And if we can recognize all of it as one thing, if we can see the all, then the neurosis of it is actually a very small attribute. It's not even half. It's, it's little compared to the entire thing. So weaving it together, I think, is really beautiful. I think that is the tantric approach. And I think that is the entire point of the experience. And I, um, I, get, I get in through a little bit differently because I, I don't participate in the, in the tantras very often. You know, I have these practices that would be Vajrayana practices, but I don't necessarily participate in these jubchens very often. I don't do these massive rituals very often that um, where people are are literally doing this, weaving these things together and and having this massive, you know, spiritual psychedelic very real, very grounded, but at the same time, incredibly spaced and very far off experience. And, um, but I don't know if I need to, because a lot of the time I think that we're all experiencing these things, whether we know it or not. So as much as ignorance can be our, most powerful neurosis and afflictive obstacle. I think that one of the ways that ignorance expresses is that we are constantly experiencing bodhicitta and liberation and spiritual activity all the time, whether we like it or not. So if I'm, if I'm upstairs meditating and doing offerings to uh to to deities and and i'm in my own world doing the spiritual practice right in my space and somebody's down here with the family feeding kids driving them around they don't want to drive them around right so they have to sacrifice their own happiness for the happiness of others and they're feeding the kid well, like all 127 deities live in everybody's body. So you feed one person, you fed all 127 deities. And when you sacrifice your own happiness for the happiness of others, you're, you're just rocking these Buddhist Bodhisattva practices. So there's all the time that like, there's people that are just, just doing Bodhisattva activity. They're behaving in Bodhisattva activity. They're doing incredibly spiritual, um, the work they're doing is spiritually profound, but it doesn't get credit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the person, the person who's doing the yoga and the meditating and the ayahuasca ceremony, they may get recognized for doing spiritual work, but like the parent who's been like baking a cake and cleaning the house, so the little kid can have, like their friends over for a birthday party or something like that. They won't get recognized in the same way as doing that profound spiritual work. Yet they're accomplishing almost all of the 37 Bodhisattva practices, especially if they're not doing it uh, with spite and resentment, but they're doing it with like the sense of acceptance and for the benefit of everybody who's going to participate in this event, which will bring joy to these people so there's like this there's like this strange paradox of the spiritually profound and the very mundane and that the absolute is actually really recognizable in the relative if we can if i can like see through what i think i know right so i, I think that everybody's actually doing these tantric practices all the time it's just some some paths, like the Vajrayana path is like 
the bullet train to the destination. Whereas, you know, just like going to work so that you can feed your family and just going through this grinder is also ultimately going to get us to a point where we will realize maybe not in this life, but I think everyone's destiny is to really wake up and realize what's going on, but it just might take longer. It's going to take significantly longer for a lot of people. And that gets me into the whole concept of like, is it the destination or the journey? Because if it's the destination, then the bullet train might not really be the best path for everybody. Right. And um, the journey if, if we're all about the journey, then like we're going to learn more walking across the country than we're going to learn flying across the country. And for people, I think I'm just going to throw this out there. I don't mean to judge you, but I'm going to. So in a way I do actually mean to judge you. But for people like us who have already sort of gone on this strange journey that has grinded us down and we were able to survive it and come out the other side and be like, holy shit, what was that? Then there's like these people who are like, hey, do you want to know what that is? Here, get on this bullet train and we'll take you through it. And then and then it's like, oh, that's what that was. That was like this massive grinder that I was just like denying myself. And like I was running away from that grief. I was running away from the grief. I couldn't take it. I wanted to just, the grief was an oblivion that I wasn't ready for. I wanted an oblivion where I didn't feel anything. I didn't want to feel that, that grief. I wanted to be completely numb. I could sit in, in the abyss for as long as I wanted. It was my destination, but I didn't want to feel anything while I was mm-hmm. there. And that was really like, that was my relationship with substance abuse disorder yeah. was that I just wasn't ready to actually sit with the reality that is in any capacity whatsoever. If I had feelings. Mm-hmm. I'm still kind of astonished that all of this many, many years in addiction, just very dramatic, traumatic experiences that I had. And I still find it, remarkable that what I was running from was my feelings. (laughs) Like it was the sensation of feeling emotion was like absolute fucking lutely not like, I'm not going to feel, I'm not going to do that. And I don't want to feel the pain. I don't want to feel, I don't want to, like you say, I don't want to feel anything. And the paradox is that I felt like I suffered more so much more from like during that time, it was very miserable. It was very like, there were times that were hell realms and it was totally. all to avoid feeling something in the moment, which is just so strange and bizarre. It's like, yeah. but, but totally understandable because I didn't have capacity to feel it. I, it was too much. It was going to obliterate me. Like you said, like it was, it was going to overwhelm me and obliterate me and shatter me. And I had no container for it. And so it was the container building that helped me be able to feel the feelings, but I find it bizarre and funny that all of that was because I didn't want to deeply cry, you know, deeply feel the yeah. grief. Yeah. It's bizarre. Yeah. Just this, just this insane denial of, of the experience. And yeah, like when you were talking about acceptance, I mean, that, that really nails it, especially with current events. Acceptance is something that I have to work on a lot with current events. And one thing that I learned from recovery programs is that when I took responsibility for the things that I was struggling with in my life, it was empowering. It felt horrible. I didn't want to take that responsibility. I wasn't ready for that responsibility. I I didn't have the tools necessary to work with it. Like I did this to me, Mm. right? I did this to me. Everything is my fault. Everybody that I blame justifiably or not, it doesn't matter. I actually like now there's times where I'm like, it's not even worth it. I just want, 
I did this to me. This is my fault. Because as soon as it's my fault, I get to hold it. And once it's in my hands, I have the ability to either become a control freak, which is very much a part of my character. If I, if it wasn't before I was an addict, it is now. Or I can just use it to take accountability for myself. And instead of trying to control it and be like, this is mine, I have the power or whatever, I can just be like, okay, this is, now it's my fault. It, I did this to me, so I get to work with it. Mm-hmm. If I apply that to current events, right? If I'm like, I am the oppressor, right? Which isn't very hard for me to to actually be the oppressor. It's 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 just not. It's it's genetically, it's, it's in my body. So if I if I think about the fact that like my body genetically is connected to Ireland and England. I have this dynamic where on my mother's side, being British, I am this colonial force. I I am this militarized empire that that almost took over the entire world through through very, very treacherous means, spreading diseases and, and drug addiction and human trafficking. There's no limit to the amount of suffering that the British Empire created and spread throughout the world. And at the same time, there's this oppressed side of this in my father's family, which is doing quite well now because they've been assimilated into modern you know, European American culture. But we are historically this oppressed people that were starved and colonized and trafficked and abused. And so if I'm looking at these current events and these situations, it's very strange to be like, I am Israel and I am Palestine. Both. I am both of these things. I have the genetic structure of both oppressor and victim. And they're not hard for me to find. They're very on the surface. They're very surface level, right? But then what gets a little bit beneath the surface is that every single human being is their own worst enemy. So everybody is their own oppressor. And everybody is being oppressed by this, right? So there's like this very untrustworthy, manipulative empire that is secured through this banking system that looks very very the evidence all points for it to be fourth reichish you know the banking system is it looks very fourth reichish and if you and if you don't believe the evidence for that and the and the historical records that that point to that that's okay i'm, I'm not trying to convince anyone that, that, that it is or anything is or is not anything but there definitely is this empire and this structure that is that is oppressive and it is manipulative and it is untrustworthy and it and it really wants people to trust them and and then there's this just massive amount of suffering and there's this ability to just punish innocence for absolutely no reason other than to create fear, terror, and grief. So we have like, on a very massive scale, we have the very same things that we're experiencing inside ourselves being just completely acted out on the in the external world which gets me to like i mean this this goes from current events to like the presidential elections to planetary phenomena like if we are the whole universe inside of ourselves while we are simultaneously inside of the universe and we're like watching the oppressor just con- completely smashing the oppressed and everything is just constantly falling apart 
and our and our cells you know of our body are constantly falling apart constantly rebuilding and there's just this huge massive dance and the part of it that we deny or the part of it that i deny which is which is definitely like being a white man in the united states on stolen land that has an impact on people regardless of whether or not i know it and a lot of times i am ignorant to that impact so i try to do little things like not interrupt people and and give um people who are not european americans or not male gender the opportunity to to speak right just little things like how do i show up with the willingness to actually heal in a way that can be a benefit mm-hmm. and that's like that's all that's all i know what to do right now i don't know what to do other than just showing up with the willingness Everything else seems to be a trap mm. because my own ego gets in the way. I, I get opinions on things. I think I know shit, you know, and if, if none of us are getting out of this alive and nobody's free until everybody's free, me pointing fingers at people and saying they're the problem isn't really helping anything. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I don't want to be complacent whatsoever. I don't want to uh I don't want to say that it's that I think it's okay that things are the way that they are and at the exact same time I I can recognize the big picture outside of my body and the way that it is the exact same struggle that I'm experiencing inside the the battle between the oppressor and the oppressed that that happens internally is is so profoundly displayed in the external world and all of this is like for me for my experience is all of this has to do with denying that grief and running away from it and not being able to accept ourselves and take accountability for ourselves and the fact that i know what i know about that and I've experienced what I know about that with substance use disorder and homelessness. And, and I went through all these things trying to run away from myself. I, I tried to just deny everything and just go completely numb. I don't, I don't blame anybody for wanting to freaking use fentanyl and xylazine and not get sober. Or I don't blame anyone for stockpiling guns and, and being afraid of people that don't look like them. Like I could have easily have manifested a similar neurosis to that. If my life were different, Mm -hmm. if my life were just a little bit different, I might have a stockpile of guns and a illogical fear of Brown people. But I, I didn't, my life was a little different. I just ended up on the street um, addicted to drugs and drinking myself into oblivion because I just was not able to accept the reality that, this is non-escapable and there's so much suffering and there's nothing to do except for sit with this grief and look at it and feel it. Yeah. It's the most clarity as well that I can find in these very wild times instead of, yeah, instead of pointing fingers, instead of saying, I know something about this, you know, and also, of course, I think, of course, I have my opinions about what's wrong yeah. and what's not okay and what is okay. And I really actually had to sit with this a lot because, um, like, meeting the war energy with war energy or meeting the fight with the fight. And I, there is part of me that wants to burn it down 100%, you know, that wants to be like, this is um, like, none of this is okay. And we all need to get guns and stand in front of someone until it stops. Like, I get that. I get that. And I really had to sit with like, who, what, what is inside of me about this? And the first thing, you know, the thing that arose was, yeah, I am them. Um, Yeah. The only thing I also know how to do in the face of samsara is this go in. If I can possibly create a little bit of peace inside myself then maybe I can be nicer to my parents, 
<laughs> you know, or the people that are really close to me. And then maybe there's like a little bit of peace that I can bring to that. But if I can't get my own internal, you know, the oppressor and the victim inside of me figured out and my own anger, my own being short with somebody, my own tendency to not be generous when I should be generous, to not be willing to not have that like joyful effort when it's such an easy thing to do, really. I can't, if I can't get that sorted out, what on earth do I think I'm going to do about telling people how they should feel (laughs) about Israel? Like I just, I, and of course, again, I have opinions about it, but it has to, like, this is the fertile ground. And just like we were saying before about the connection between people being like a tangible kind of field that's created and adds to the like to the good loving side of the scales, whether anybody sees it or witnesses it or not, but people, like you say, just kind of naturally doing these bodhisattva activities. It's not flashy. You can't see it. You can't post about it on social media. Even talking about it is weird, you know, but I don't know of a more powerful place to start than, than that very close place. And I'll, and so this get back, gets back to the question that I was, I was kind of getting to before, which is like, for me, when I'm resourced, when I have enough, so amazingly stupid and simple, but like enough sleep, when I have been doing my practices, when I have enough structure in my life, that it feels like, that it feels like I don't have to make a decision every time if I'm going to get up and do my practices or not. It's like, okay, I'm just going to get up. I'm going to like, I have some structure and foundation for my day. I'm getting enough rest. I'm, you know, like what is good for my body and um, through food and exercise and things like that are taken care of when I'm resourced, I'm a lot nicer, you know, I'm a lot, I'm a much nicer person. And so my, and I'm more present and I can be more conscious when moments arise, when normally I might default to the ungenerous aspect of myself or say something, you know, like that worldview too, like something comes out of my mouth and I'm like, fuck, what the, why did I say that? You know, what, where did that come from? You know, those, (laughs) (laughs) there's more space. So those moments happen less if I'm really resourced. And again, that's another place for me that I see, you know, that we can look around the world and see, I have a beautiful, comfortable house. I have family. I have enough food. I have, you know, my body works well enough. Like I'm not afflicted by um, addiction to substances at the moment. Like I, I have all of this going for me and I'm still, I still find myself being ungenerous and still find myself like saying the stupid thing that I shouldn't say or whatever. So and I have all of this support and foundation. And so it also makes sense to me that people who are in continual trauma responses because of their, because of the circumstances of their life, uh, yeah, they're not gonna, like, what can, that's where the compassion comes in. That's where the huge compassion comes in. So my question to you is how, if you use that language or not, like, how do you stay resourced? What, what do you do so that um, you can more often show up like generous, kind, willing to be in a connection with someone, uh, even if they've built a prison for themselves. Like, how do you, how do you keep your center so that you can do the work of a, you know, the Bodhisattva work really? I try to keep it really simple. I haven't always, I used to want to do fantastic secret practices and I wanted to be, you know, special and, uh, magic and do things differently than than other people you know if 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 somebody would have told me that friggin making oatmeal for the kids and driving them to school was probably more spiritual than meditating and doing yoga by myself i would have argued you know what i mean i i wasn't i wasn't ready for that for the truth of that but one thing that i that i do is nundra and i i don't think that anything is actually as grounding as nundra practice except for possibly the niyamas of 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 yoga and and i don't stretch i don't i'm not like a stretchy person i try to touch my toes and i do some qigong or whatever but when i talk about yoga i'm not I'm not wearing tight pants and I'm not on a mat and I'm not in the studio paying anybody any amount of money to, um, 
to teach me how to stretch. When when I'm talking about Nundro, you know, in a safe in a safe capacity, I I don't know how to talk about Nundro in a way that wouldn't break Samaya, wouldn't break promises, but I think I can do this. The karmas are like in our head, right? In Sanskrit, our head's called the karma shaya because it, it means like sack of karmas, right? So if I can get to a point where my karmas internally are manageable, gentle, and not even gentle all the time, but just manageable. You know, they can be wrathful and they can be goofy and silly. They can express themselves in all kinds of ways. I just want to be able to be, have it manageable. I need to be able to navigate through the karmas and also take a break from them so I can recharge and then engage later on. And that's really where the connection bit comes in, connecting with people If I can recognize the Buddha nature in you, regardless of who you are, whether you are some sort of stock-broking yacht club Manhattan billionaire, or if you are just somebody on the street that can't speak English yet, and you're strung out on fentanyl and crystal meth, and it doesn't matter anywhere you are in the circle or in the pyramid, if I can recognize the Buddha nature in you and, and see through the ignorance, and if, and if we can connect in a way that inspires others to be able to recognize the infinite in, in all the things from the dandelions to the, to the police sirens, you know, like whatever, if we can actually recognize the infinite in that, this higher power, this Buddha nature, the bodhicitta, you know, tomorrow, whatever you want to call it. If we can, if we can recognize that, then we're no longer ignorant and we're out of the system. We're out of the system. The system teaches us to compete with each other. You know, it, it teaches us to want to control each other. We have relationship dynamics with control issues. We have competitive financial dynamics. We compete with our neighboring cities through sports, which is nationalism. Totally like my city's better than your city. My school's better than your school. So we have these little tiny pockets of neurosis that are celebrated with the all-American diet of hot dogs and hamburgers. And we, we wave our flags and stuff. And, and there's just all these things that divide us, men's rooms, women's rooms, Democrats, Republicans, um, pro-Israel, pro-Palestine, all, it's all division. It's just dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing. And if we can just hang out and recognize and see through that and we get out of that system, then we've just, we've just, everybody who gets out of the system it gets weaker no matter how many times we go back in and as we go in and out, it just gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And there's nothing that weakens the system more than us actually connecting with each other. There'd actually be no reason why anybody in the United States would be fearful or feel threatened by Mexico if it wasn't for this spectacular propaganda machine, you know, you don't want human trafficking. Then, then who's who's the market for human trafficking? You don't want drugs in the country. Well, who is the market for drugs? Why are you getting mad at your supplier for your demand? Right? There's why is there this whole concept of private property there's this whole and it's just humans it's people peopling right so i don't think communism is the answer i don't think capitalism is the answer i don't think isms are the answer i mean we we look at at the sermon on the mount like what jesus is talking about and then and then we're able to turn what jesus is talking about into a, a church and a religion 
that colonizes the world. And it's like, if we can do that with wisdom teachings, then we can, we can humanize anything and just totally corrupt anything and turn anything into ignorance, attachment, and aversion, right? It doesn't matter what it is. We can find the neurosis in it and we can run with it. That's one thing that being alive for four years has taught me. It doesn't matter what we do. We will always be able to find the neurosis in it, and people will. And that's totally okay. I mean, there's, there's a neurosis in getting out of the system, right? Blissful ignorance. So I think that, I think that the connection part is just, is just to really find that freedom, the ability to get out recharge recognize that infinite force that buddha nature that 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 there is no beginning or end to any of this that we are all in this together and that our our greatest curses are our greatest blessings and vice versa our greatest blessings are our greatest curses and that this is actually totally fine and the reason why we find it difficult to accept that this is totally fine is because this is us. This is ourself. And we haven't fully became capable yet of accepting ourselves. We are still denying specific aspects of the experience and existing. And the neurosis is running wild as a result of that and connecting with each other gives us this freedom to really recognize things and we can get out of ourselves and we can actually get out of the system and there's there's liberation and freedom in connection and i don't think there's liberation and freedom without connection and i think that is that is why the human body is so precious mm -hmm. i've been thinking about this a lot i've been thinking about like influence and i've been thinking about all kinds of things but one of them is that our bodies are wired. Like we are antennas. We are, we're connection seeking animals. You know, we want yeah. to be with each other. We want to feel each other. We want to look at each other, you know, with kind of like unmasked faces. We want to, um, to feel safe with each other. And we're constantly looking for it. We're constantly looking for it, for that safety. And that, um, that like homecoming just to the simplicity of being with each other. So yes, yeah, everything you're saying deeply resonating. I I want to give you, <laughs> if you want, an opportunity to talk about, you know, I've heard about um, fentanyl in the drug supply and just this, you know, how, how like one pill and someone dies, that it's oh, yeah. very bizarre and that it's mixed in with lots of different drugs that you wouldn't expect it to be in. Um, I don't know about the other drug that you were talking about but I would love if you would, if you would like to, to talk about harm reduction, that's a big one for me, you know, how, how vilified, you know, extremely suffering people are. And to me, it's part of like looking at our collective shadow again, not seeing that, oh, that, you know, that could be me very, very easily. Uh, and so harm reduction is a huge, I'm, I'm very pro harm reduction, giving people dignity helping people get needs met if that's the best that we can do. So I, but you know much more about it than I do. And I would love if you would like to, to, to talk about that. Yeah, I would on like a very relative level, harm reduction is what you just mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, for real. And that's, and it's huge. The relative contains the ultimate it, it's there. Uh, it's just meeting people where they're at and treating people with dignity and recognizing that they are people, right? That's it. It's nothing more than that. Getting people access to get their needs met, regardless of where they're at in life. That's it. It's very simple. And when you get down to like our relationships with neurosis, everybody has a relationship with neurosis that we have because we're trying to get our needs met. Our behavior is based off of trying to get our needs met. So everyone 
relationships with ignorance, attachment, and aversion is based off of our experience with trying to get our needs met. So if we just allow people to have access to getting their basic needs met, medical attention, water, food, shelter, if at all possible, we have a, we have a reduced amount of suffering, which can be seen in like a lower crime rate, which can be seen in mental health. People have less episodes for lack of a better word. There's still psychosis. There's still mania. There's still all of the things that come with a drug supply that is specifically designed by chemists and their sponsors to give people psychosis, uh, such as a lot of the crystal meth has MDMA in it, which is ecstasy, like the, the root ingredient of ecstasy. But it's also a psychedelic, and it, when it combines with amphetamines, it puts people into psychosis. So why are they putting MDMA in the methamphetamine? Why is more than half of the methamphetamine supply in, in the cities, why does it have MDMA in it if people aren't trying to put people into psychosis? And then we have, you know, we had this, we had opium, you know, we had opium, we had heroin, we had, we had oxycotton, we had the, we had the great introduction to narcotic into white America, upper class and middle class white America really got hit with the pharmaceuticals. So we got this fentanyl, which is very strong and it's really easy to overdose on and the, and it's very addictive. So people put it into the drug supply of cocaine. So you have people at bars because bar culture likes to do cocaine. You have people at bars ODing. They'll go into the bathroom and do a line and they'll fall out. And that's not uh, rare. You have so many people doing cocaine and overdosing from fentanyl that the drug cartels in Arizona and the Mexican side of the border are actually saying, like, if you get caught, putting fentanyl in our cocaine, like there'll be consequences. We will punish you. So that's basically like what's going on with uh, fentanyl. We have a massive amount of opiates that are $1.50 a pill. I could go downtown right now and I can get a hundred pills for $150. Not a problem. Who's making money off that? Are the are the people who are putting the pills together? Are they making money off of a dollar fifty a pill? Um, are the people pressing the pills? Are they are they making money off of that? Are the distributors on a street level? How many times are you going to divide a dollar fifty up before everybody gets like what twenty five cents per pill? Maybe if you're lucky, depending on the size of your operation people aren't actually getting paid off of this. The only thing that's getting paid off of this is that a very undesirable aspect of society is being completely annihilated, allowing the community to kill themselves through their own powerlessness with the, with addiction. Right. So it's all, it's all very, very tragic and nasty. And it's just part of the system. It's just part of samsara. And one of the things that I love about harm reduction is that it can be applied to anything. It doesn't just have to be drugs and it doesn't have to just be our relationship with the unhoused or with narcotics addicts or, or anything. Harm reduction really is the way to show up for people. And it is the way to actually have that willingness. It's like, okay, you have an ego, you have an identity, you have a relationship with ignorance, you have attachments, you have aversions, so do I. How do I operate with all of the things, with all of the obstacles? How do I operate? How do I meet myself where I'm at without pretending to be anywhere else, better or worse, and cause the least amount of harm as possible?
right? If I'm going to shoot drugs, I want to be able to do it in a way that I don't leave my needles around. I also want to do it in a way that if I get an infection, I have access to medical treatment. And I don't want to do it in a way that inspires people who haven't done this before to do it themselves, right? So that's harm reduction on like a street drug level. But harm reduction is also like, I'm driving a car and it weighs seven tons and it's steel. And I'm going to friggin' at any moment, I could totally just kill people, bugs, deer, or whatever. So how do I move this, this seven ton object at 80 miles per hour skillfully in a way that causes the least amount of harm? So everybody's actually practicing harm reduction and ways um, pretty off, pretty, pretty often. We don't even realize it. Like people who practice the Bodhisattva practices don't realize it. Harm reduction to me is the only thing that makes sense. It's the only approach to life that actually allows us the freedom to be human without perfectionism. I don't need to be sober for 80 fucking years in order to, you know, have the respect of my peers. All I need to do is actually be honest with myself and the people around me with where I'm at and accept the consequences of my actions and be accountable and do so in a way that causes the least amount of harm to everyone around me and everything around me, including myself. I don't see any difference between harm reduction and maybe somebody's desire to want to be vegan. How do I cause the least amount of harm? Maybe I'll stop eating meat. That's fucking harm reduction, right? But maybe I'll just try that, see where that takes me. <laughs> Let's cause less harm. Let's cause less harm. If we could do harm reduction with politics, if we could do harm reduction with our with our friggin' medical situation, if we could do harm reduction with war, if we could just do harm reduction with everything. If we could apply harm reduction to the 2024 elections, because that's really all anybody's opportunity to vote is. What is the harm reduction vote? Who is the friggin' asshole who is going to cause the least amount of harm in the world? I don't really want voting to be an act of harm reduction, but we actually live in a society where harm reduction can be applied to just about everything. And even if we lived in some sort of utopian, you know, Chug Yum Trump or Rinpoche talked about an enlightened society, even if we lived in like an enlightened society, there's still a neurosis to everything. So we have to be able to recognize that neurosis and cause the least amount of harm. So doing every, anything from like, there's no limit to it. It just, harm reduction, it just gives us the freedom to be ourselves, meet ourselves where we're at and connect with people and allow people to literally be themselves. If you're an alcoholic and you live under a bridge and you pee your pants every day and you are dangerous to be around after 3.30 in the afternoon because you're angry and your liver's failing and you can have violent outbursts, that's okay, right? I'll, I'll try to meet with you at like 10 o'clock in the morning and just because you can't stop drinking doesn't mean that you're a horrible person that needs to go to prison so that somebody who privatized these prisons can capitalize off of your suffering. Like all it really means is that like you're, you're struggling. There's no connection. The suffering is, is unbearable to a point. There's no, there's no reason to do anything else. You know, we're just drowning in this suffering. So punishing people for drowning in suffering is just another attribute of the, of the system itself, the division of, of the people itself. So the more we can actually connect with people, you know, the more we can actually experience that liberation, freedom and connection. That's the, that's the biggest weapon we have against the system, against samsara. And that's all harm reduction is really harm reduction is the solution to all of my problems. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I love to get you. I love to just let you talk because you, because I, I am listening, you know, I'm listening and I'm hearing places that I can apply it to my own life and can apply it to my, you know, I had concrete examples arise as you were talking about that, like ways that I could practice harm reduction and ways that I am being selfish and 
taking actions that are self-serving that actually are not that great for me either, you know, that are creating harm and full compassion for that, right? Like happening from my own uh, past arriving in this moment, like happening because of all the things that happened to me as a kid and because of my ancestors, my ancestors, ancestors, and like the environment that I grew up in and the world, you know, this country that I, all these things, decisions that I made, choices that I made to try to get my own needs met. And then arriving in this moment and thinking that that's the way that it works. Like thinking that that, like, oh, if I, that I can still get this need met if I sort of grasp or try to take or cling or something. And as you were talking, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> like I could, you know, what is actually the most, the most uh, not only compassionate, but the way that I can cause the least harm here, which only yeah. ever helps me as well. It's not just, it's not, it's for the other person, certainly. And it's also for me because we are, there is not, because it's same, same, you know. Cause totally. It, cause totally. It's, yeah. Because I'm not free until everyone's free and I'm not, you know, it's only, I will have to deal with the consequences of my misunderstanding at some point anyway, or if I have capacity, which I do, and if I have the awareness, which, you know, is what opened up when you were talking about that, then I can choose something different. And being able to choose is like enormous freedom and so powerful. You know, when I was, when I was in addiction, when I, when I am underneath like a ripening of karma that is happening from the past and I can't even really see around it and I'm just triggered or afflicted, you know, and I don't really have any awareness of that. I don't really have control in that moment. I can't, I don't really have choice. It's just, it's like the, the arising, the happening, but if I have choice, if I can make a little bit of space and choose something different, which I don't want to choose by the way, like, <laughs> like sometimes it's just like, no, I want to do the thing. I want to do whatever the thing is, you know, but like being able to make a different choice and having the ability to see that making that different choice will benefit not only myself, but other people, you know, where you were talking about, you know, making oatmeal and driving kids around, you know, that's the, that's the part that, I mean, to be perfectly honest, like I, I haven't fully come to terms with yet. I'm much closer than I used to be but fully coming to terms with the idea that like, it's quite simple. And depending on your definition of sexy, like it's kind of the unsexy thing. It's not like the, yeah. it's not like this, the glamour, glamour, sparkly, um, exciting, you know, nervous system activating, <laughs> like, you know, get, it's like, no, it's actually just, did you get enough sleep? Did you, yeah. were you, were you nice? Did you smile at that person? You know, was I, totally. was I nice when I, normally would be less generous like that's the stuff yeah that's the stuff totally totally that's it that's really that's that's it and um it's hard to see it sometimes especially because we're you know that's the way the system is set up the system is set up to encourage self-grasping and division you know it's part of the reason why punk is dead and that it's true, you know, like, I don't know how deep you ever got into punk rock, but Crass wrote punk is dead. Right. And they wrote punk is dead because like what you said earlier, hating the hate is not really conducive to anything other than creating more hate, but also the fact that the resistance is being marketed mm -hmm. to the people through the system. So when, when the system itself is selling the resistance to itself, to the people, it's no different than people showing up at the, you know, in California for the gold rush and working for a mining company, but the mining company also sells the boots and the shovels and the hats and everything like that. Yeah. So, and the booze and, you know, the, 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 the brothel, everything's owned by the, by the mining company so everybody who goes out there for the gold rush all their money is just being circulated around it's basically just like a huge pyramid scheme it's how rehabs work with the insurance money too you know so that's how the music industry was they're like we're gonna get these bands that are gonna talk about liberation and anarchy and fuck the system but we're gonna sell them to you and and it was the system itself selling it to people 
Mm-hmm. So it's just sort of um, assimilating the resistance into the empire and then selling it back to the people, right? That's that's punk is dead, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and it's true, punk is dead. You can't you can't argue that it's, it's been dead since you know. But the spirit of it will never because we there's um, we want to be free. If we didn't, if we didn't want to be free, I don't think we would have been born, mm. you know, and that's part of the paradox. I think we put ourselves into this, into this situation where we're really have no choice, but to work with duality. And regardless of whether or not we can live in a state of non-duality and non-dualistic recognition, the world around us is still operating from a state of duality. So who's really benefiting from, from me living in a state of non-duality isolated from the world on top of a mountain? I don't know. I I didn't think many people were, but who's going to benefit from somebody who's actually like connecting with the people and who actually has the ability to walk in and out of duality in a way that is harm reduction. How are we going to do this without, with causing the least amount of harm? How are we going to recognize the Buddha nature and every single person and animal and plant and planetary body? And how are we going to recognize the universe and each other while we're walking around in the universe and in how do we recognize the world and each other when we're walking around in the world itself? So it's like this, it's this great paradox that only makes sense when we stop trying to make sense of it. But it really, it really comes down to, I'm really glad you brought up harm reduction because that's, that's the solution for me. Like the 37 Bodhisattva practices and harm reduction is like, that's it. Like, I can blast off into the farthest regions of LSD and tantric practices and completely blow my brains out in a state of controlled psychosis and mania and come back with a, with a open heart and no karmic activity whatsoever in my head. But what good is that going to do if I, if I can't meet, myself and people where they're at what what if i think i'm better than somebody else or i'm more advanced than somebody else then it just creates more division more ignorance more attachment you know more more materialism i uh i don't think there is any higher accomplishment than we can attain spiritually than recognizing each other and being of service I don't think there's any amount of ayahuasca that we can eat or any tantric practice we can be initiated, which will take us anywhere farther than recognizing the Buddha nature in each other and being of service to each other and and all beings. I think that all of this stuff that really expands our mind and opens our heart is to just get us to that point. This is it. We're in it. We're swimming in liberation right now, but it's like at the same time, we're not, we're not done working out our, our knots. We still got knots. We still got kinks. We still have an oppressor that lives inside of us and outside of us. We still have an oppressed, which lives inside of us and outside of us. Arm reduction. A it's, revolutionary act. It is. Yeah. Just feed your neighbor. Just take care of each other. It's, it. it's no different than like, it actually is the teachings of the spiritual traditions it is feeding the poor it is clothing the poor it is hanging out with the people who suffer the most is being in the street with the thieves and and the sex workers and all these things that society shuns yet society society just couldn't function without them you know society just could not function without the lower class and without sex workers and without drug addicts and you know the prison system and just all these things the system itself cannot function without the without the undesirable element i mean i buddha went into homelessness 
you know, uh, Jesus was in the homelessness. These, there's just all of these enlightened yogis go into homelessness. All of these living Buddhas achieve awakening through, I mean, Garchin Rinpoche achieved awakening through torture, you know, in prison. And uh, so there, there is, you know, the suffering does work for some people. But when we're able to actually behave in the ways that these awakened beings and it doesn't matter. We don't have to put a, we don't have to put a label on it. We don't have to say like, I'm doing this, this religious work, right? I'm not doing the spiritual work of, you know, meditating and offering to the deities. I'm doing the spiritual work of, feeding the unhoused a bunch of pizzas that would have just normally been thrown away and making sure that they have clean needles and socks. Right. So what's, what's ultimately more spiritual, but there's a time and place for everything. I need to sit down on a pillow by myself in a room in isolation and let my karmas settle or mm-hmm. else I won't be able to go outside and feed the unhoused pizzas and make sure that there's enough clean needles and I won't be able to go to the homeless shelter and mop the floors and clean the toilets. I just won't be able to do that. I'll be too wrapped up in my own experience. I'll, I'll start judging myself and other people. I'll get angry and I'll start resenting my job and society and my opinions on current events and the political situation will come to the surface. And I won't. I won't be able to get refuge from them i need isolation so that i can take refuge in the buddha the dharma and the sangha and recovery unity and service and i and i can go out into the world and be like i recognize you you know Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you're a member of the country club playing golf or if you're in the gutter i i can recognize you even if you can't recognize yourself and that's, that's what I think harm reduction really is. I think harm reduction is anarchy and is equality. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the most punk rock thing that we could ever really do. I think punk rock really got hijacked. I think it's totally dead. And it turned into just another way of us to decorate our ego and have competitive egos and advertise our egos. But in its true core, it's it's nothing it's nothing outside of the desire to be to be free and and liberated from the system and from samsara thank you john thank you (laughs) (laughs) thank you robin (laughs) is there um is there anything else you want to you want to add in before we close no i just really appreciate you thank you so much robin Oh my gosh, I, um, my pleasure. I think that you're doing really cool, really good work. And uh, I'm just really glad that we know each other and, and we're connected. I'm, I'm, I'm just glad we're friends. Thanks Me a too. lot. Thank you again to John for an amazing conversation. And thank you to Morgan Jenks for our musical soundscapes. If you'd like to learn more about either of them or about the upcoming Bridge Collective, my one-on-one services, including past life and between life regressions, as well as sessions to communicate with your guides, please check the show notes. You can also buy my book, join my Patreon, and learn more about my work by visiting honeyheart.org.